I'd like to talk to you today about one of my favorite topics. My dad has this saying, and his saying is, sometimes I just sits and thinks, and sometimes I just sits. Well, you know, I've really adopted that sort of way of living a life, especially in the last 10 years or so. I've realized that on a regular basis, I have to take the time to sometimes sit and think and sometimes just sit. One of my favorite things to do is to find a comfortable place in front of my window and look out at the world. Watch the birds on the grass or the squirrels running up the trees or the cars going by and just let whatever thoughts I'm thinking to sort of surface. I follow them without getting too involved, and I think about it all a little bit. I've been able to resolve a lot of challenges in my life and in my psyche because I've made sure to take the time to sometimes sit and think, and sometimes to just sit. I was watching a video earlier today about the differences between people who feel emotionally connected and the people who don't feel emotionally connected. And one of the main reasons people would feel connected is because they felt worthy of love. And one of the most prominent reasons that people would feel disconnected is because they felt unworthy of love. So how does this tie in? So a lot of people don't take the time to look at things. They don't take the time to look out the window or to watch the birds. They don't take the time to think about the feelings and the experiences that are going on in their lives. They've always got good reasons. I'm too busy. There's too much that has to get done. I can sleep when I die. <laughs> Things like those. We all have really great reasons to not sit with how we're feeling or what we're thinking and really let it unfold. Look at it. Watch it without too much judgmentalism. Just kind of let it be. Now, one of the reasons some people don't take the time is because those thoughts and feelings can be pretty uncomfortable. And it's hard to sit there without that judgmentalism. When we stop, we suddenly can feel all of the guilt, shame, fear that we've been trying to get other people to feel. In my life, I've noticed that as soon as I look at someone and say, I can't believe they would do that. They're such an idiot. Usually, within the next five minutes, or at least within the next day or two, an example comes up where I see that I do the same thing, usually for a very good reason. Not, I would never drive through a stop sign, but sometimes I'm too distracted or too angry to drive carefully. Suddenly I feel guilty, righteous, nervous, and it's as if all that judgmentalism I've been feeling towards others has been waiting for me to notice it. The trick is to regularly take the time to sit with uncomfortable feelings so they don't build up. To feel and think without deciding whether what's going on is either right or wrong or good or bad. It's a very Buddhist principle to sit back and just observe what's going on. One of the main reasons I perceived that people don't let themselves sit and think is because they don't think they're worth it. They don't think they're worthy of sitting and watching the birds. Who am I? We've been taught that it's a terrible waste of time, that it's beneath us. I always think of a bag lady or old man sitting in the park feeding the pigeons. Somehow that we're slovenly, slothful, because we're not getting all the things done that we should. Well, let me tell you, I've discovered that everybody has a list of things that they're working on. Things that they haven't gotten done. Things that they could get done. Things that they could achieve. Things that they could be. We all have a list. And that list is never going to go away. When I accept that and say, well, I'm always going to have a list. It gives me the space to stop and sit and think. And when I do that, 
it gives me an opportunity to realize some of those things on the list I don't really need to do. One of the easiest ways of cutting down on your to-do list is recognizing that half of them aren't really necessary. I sit and think about, what's the purpose? What do I get out of it? What does it mean to me? Is there another way of doing it? When I take a half an hour to reflect on whether something is necessary to be happy, I usually save myself a few hours. On the other hand, even when people don't have much to do, they like to fill their time with something so they don't have to sit. They plan, organize, discuss sports teams, fight over the football game. Sitting without thinking or without doing anything is pretty hard to do. There were days I slept the day away because I didn't want to face feeling lonely or anxious because I had nothing to do. When I finally couldn't sleep anymore, I realized I'd rather be awake and feeling something than losing days and days of my life. Whether you think too much or think too little, we all get tired of being around people and needing to respond all the time and problem solving and being somebody, accomplishing things. We run ourselves until we're so wound up We're either tired and sleep all the time, or we're tired and we don't sleep at all. But either way, we're just this hamster on a treadmill, and we're not getting anywhere. We don't really sit and feel, and then look at why we keep doing the same things we've always been doing, and what our patterns are, and whether our patterns are working for us or not. One of the greatest gifts I've gotten is being given the opportunity to be out of a job. When I was let go, it devastated me because I'm quite the overachiever. I had been working since, you know, I was 15, and I felt like I always needed to be productive. I either needed to be working or studying or reaching a goal. But now I had time. I had all of this time, and I had to do something with it, and it forced me to look at life and really decide for myself what was important to me and what wasn't. One of the gifts that a lot of people have gotten out of the recession and out of unemployment and losing their jobs is that their priorities have changed. Their lives have more quality to them and more depth. Their relationships have gotten better. For the people that have looked at it and taken the time to really reflect, they've come out of this experience, this really hard experience, as people who really are happier. Now, most people believe that stress means everything is going to fall apart. That's what most of us are scared of. We're scared of things happening to us and of taking the time because it means that everything is either going to fall apart or it is falling apart. But really, a lot of times when we have a rough patch, it forces us to reevaluate our lives and reevaluate what's important to us and really nurture that. There's a reason that the people who are the wisest spiritual leaders around live in rusty trailers or caves or in the middle of nowhere. They don't have much, you know, mainly because they've discovered that they don't need much. That life is a lot easier the more we simplify it. And it's a lot easier when we give ourselves the time to sit and sit and think. You know, a lot of people will say, that I have this responsibility and I have that responsibility and there is so much on my shoulders. How can I not do some of them? It's not possible and I've got so many things I want to accomplish, so many things I want to do, so many things I want to be. There just isn't time for it all. One of my best friends asks, how's that working for you? 
he always asks the question for whatever it is, how is it working for you? If your life doesn't look the way that you'd like it to look, is it because you haven't achieved enough? Or is it because you're trying to achieve too much? Is it because you haven't found the fulfillment in what's actually going on? Now underneath that question is another question. This is the question I like to ask people. Why haven't you? You know, people, people know, we all know what we should or should not be doing, how we should be living. We all know how important it is to connect and to relate. Things along those lines. And whenever anybody gives us advice, me included, my first response is, I already know that. Don't talk to me about that. But the question underneath that is, why aren't you? Why aren't you living in a way that can make you feel fulfilled? Why aren't you living in a way that brings you the peace or the joy that you're looking for? When we start investigating that question, when we start looking without too much judgmentalism as to why we don't make the choices that we want to be making, usually the first level says, okay, how do I problem solve this? How do I work around it? What's in my way? As my partner likes to say, plan the work and work the plan. But underneath that is another question. The question is, does it really matter? Does it really matter that my life looks this way or my life looks that way? Does it really matter if I achieve a certain status or if I get whatever makes me feel better? Does it really matter? And that's the question to ask, to pare down your life so you recognize what really matters to you, and then looking at how you can honestly achieve that, breaking all of the rules, coloring outside all of the lines, walking through all of the walls. Looking at what really matters to you and saying to yourself, Okay, what am I going to do to get that? For me, it was peace of mind, and it was fulfilling relationships, and it was feeling real and connected. That mattered more to me than anything, and it was only when I was willing to break all of the rules of what makes a good person or what makes a bad person when I was willing to have compassion for myself and everybody else for how we as human beings work, that's when I walked through that wall and it gave me the opportunity to let myself sit and sit and think. And that's what keeps making my life get better and better.